Well, I, this is a bit of unexpected uh, joy to have time, more time with you, but <clears throat> I mean, we were going to do different things and you were going to have fun and now you're here, so poor... <laughs> <laughs> So we'll make it as fun as we can. Uh, but I appreciate, dearly, uh, deeply appreciate uh, Narshawan uh, adding to, responding to uh, that theme this morning because it's such a wonderful theme. And and what what a great thing, you know, that we were both there together and we had such similar experiences, you know. A reminder that everyone uh, in the room with Baba is thinking that, well, he's here just for me, and uh, this is, you know, what I'm going through is what he's doing, and of course everybody's thinking the same thing. <laughs> and that's, that was his, uh, you know, his, his gift, uh, which translates today into being in our lives uh, present all the time. But at the time, it just struck me as so extraordinary that you would hear later people say this and that about what happened uh, in a particular darshan or session, even if it was a large crowd, right? And they would, oh, you know, and Baba looked at me, or Baba, right? And uh, you thought it was all about you, right? <laughs> um, well, I was 13, so. Uh, That did make me feel, think of a, a wonderful story about the, the, the joke in the barn, but I won't tell it now. <laughs> Should I? All right. I, I had, I had a, the theme that I was going to bring up, which I will in a minute, uh, to discuss would be interesting to do, but, you know, maybe a little lighthearted thing is better right now to begin with. Anyway, this is uh, a story I think many of you may have heard me tell. <clears throat> um, I don't know, I don't repeat it in the book that I wrote with my experiences because it's my mother's experience, so I didn't include it. But um, mother did not, I think I mentioned, she did not immediately have recognition, right? Baba didn't give her that immediately. <laughs> so this was before the recognition and she had a lot of preconceived ideas about what the Christ should be, you know? She grew up in the South and, you know, the Christian uh, context. And in the South, that's a particular context. And uh, certain ideas about what Christ would be or is. And, and um, so she was a little unsure about all this. She wanted to, to see him as the Christ. But, you know, she just wasn't quite there yet. So anyway, she went to the barn one day, one morning, uh, and uh, Baba, you know, uh, usually the idea is you get as close as you can, or at least that was my idea. Mother's idea was you get as far away as you can. <laughs> but, you know, she wasn't sure what to do and what's this and you know, like that. So she sat way in the back. And she sat next to this older lady from New York. She didn't really know, but you know, the older ones, the mother was not an older one, but she took one of those chairs. Most people just sat on the floor with Baba, right? But she, <laughs> she was as far away from Baba as you can be in the barn. You all get picture of the barn, so you see. And <clears throat> Baba's up front. And so at one point, Baba's, you know, there's a discourse being given or read. You know, Baba brought discourses with him uh, to read out. And some of them were quite, uh, you know, esoteric in the sense, you know, you had to really, uh, not me, I was, but the, the, pay attention, you know, there were complicated topics and ego and this and that. And so people were, you know, concentrating and trying to, I think Don Stevens must have read out some, uh, Erich, like that. And Baba sometimes would interrupt and add something or make a comment. So this particular day, Baba was, it was a very serious thing, and then Baba uh, stopped it. 
at us. And he said, now it's time for a joke. Now this is something he would do quite frequently. And if you were on to Baba, you, you had a joke. You know, if you really were wanted to please Baba, you had a joke at the ready. I don't know how many people did, but you, that would have been the smart thing to do. Because who knows when he's going to ask for a joke and call on you. And then you're going to have to think of something. So anyway, he stopped and he, he, he said, now, <clears throat> Mickey, Mickey Florsheim, Mickey, you told Baba a joke yesterday at his house, at my house. And I enjoyed the joke. So now I want you to get up and tell everybody the joke. Mickey was mortified because it's one thing, you know this, it's one thing to, to tell an off-color joke to Baba in the little living room with Erich. It's another thing to get up in front of a whole group of people and say, you know, you had private time with Baba and what did you do? You told this off-color joke. <laughs> I mean, it was embarrassing. He was just like, oh my God goodness, no, I don't want to. And you could tell, you know, the body language. So poor, poor Mickey, what could he do? Baba asked for a, so he got up. And he was very reluctant about it, you know, naturally at first. But once he got going, he really got into it, you know. And, uh, and he told it, you know, Baba liked it if you were expressive and all that. You know, Baba, Baba's humor is that way. And Baba, when he told jokes, was very expressive. <clears throat> so... You know, Mickey got into it and, you know, and so forth. Now, I don't remember the joke. Mother, I mean, I wasn't there. Mother doesn't remember the joke. Uh, it's not recorded. Uh, it was something, Mother thinks it was something about an elephant in a sports car. That's all she can remember. So if it was, it was off color in the 1950s, it must have been something about elephant peeing on the sports car, something, you know, silly. But nevertheless, uh, Considered off color for that period, I guess. Um, so he got up, he told the joke, and my mother's in the back, and she is thinking if he is who he says he is, if he's the Christ, why would he why would he have this joke told in his presence? You know? I mean, it just, that was her thought. But being Southern, that's not what she said. What she said to the lady next to her, she whispered to her. She didn't say she didn't, she didn't like the joke. She said, ha, huh, I didn't even understand it. <laughs> right? I didn't even understand it. And, you know, she just whispered this to the lady. And remember, she was way back here. And Bob immediately goes, and he says, Mickey, Baba wants you to get up and tell the joke again because you see, Mickey, Jane didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor mother. You know, <laughs> she's back there. And in that moment, in that moment, she said, all of those preconceived notions of what he was supposed to be, what he's supposed to be like, and this and that, wiped away. Just went, never came back. It just, in that instant, it was all wiped away. And somehow, she knew he knew. And poor Mickey. So this is what reminded me, because uh, Mickey's experience, my mother's experience is what I always talk about and remember, but what about poor Mickey? You know, does it, uh, nobody's here to say Mickey's story, right? So I'm going to say that poor Mickey had to get up again in front of all these people and tell this stupid off-color joke again. And this time he had no enthusiasm whatsoever. <laughs> he did not get into it at all. <laughs> but in obedience, he said it again. And Bob, of course, said, Baba says, it's wonderful, you know, and Baba said, I like it very much, I laughed and all that. 
<laughs> so that's, that's my Mickey Florsheim, Jane Haynes uh, joke story. And I love that story. I love that story. Um, I love that Baba loved jokes so much. Um, so I wanted to share with you, you knew you wouldn't have a session without a card. <laughs> it just comes with the territory. I just love these things, you know. I love these kind of cards and stuff. So I love making them, I mean, or having them made. And, um, and this particular photo came out so beautifully. It see, it's almost 3D, you know. Uh, you know, the, the printer that I use did a good job, although I will say David Finster's site, you know, you can download a digital thing. So you get a better quality, you know, if you're going to use it for something like this. And uh, is that from his, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. So the digital is really wonderful. Anyway, so, and so you'll see, it's just almost like it's three-dimensional. Baba at the center, of course, in, in 1956. Um, and uh, just a beautiful image of him. So I'm going to pass these out because the quote on the back is what we're going to talk a little bit about or share a little bit about. Or you can also ask other things. You don't have to talk about any particular thing. Everybody getting on now? You're the slowest passers outer. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Give it, give it to somebody. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did everybody get one? Come on, Edward. No, over here. No names. Are they coming over this way? All right. I've heard it. Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. Hmm? What's that? That's it? Paul, give me one. I gave them all back to you instead of keeping one. Thank you. So, this is one of the very most important things Baba said in my life, really, which I can tell you why in a second. But, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear how you feel about this, about following your conscience. So, um, uh, would somebody like to just read it out, so, so it's not just me talking? Or enjoy somebody like Tony? We do that loud and clear. Do nothing, even to please me or the world, against the dictates of your own conscience. Unhesitatingly, do what you think to be right and proper. Despite the opposition of the world, let your mind be firm as a rock that resists strong blasts of wind from all sides. Mayor Baba. So Baba gave this in the 1930s, and it's from a little book, Sayings of Mayor Baba. <clears throat> and um, so let me first say that I think one of the greatest examples of what this might mean in our lives with Baba comes from Erich, of course. It's in the wonderful book that is, is over there, but it's, uh, I'm sure, you, if you don't have it, you must have it. The stories of, that Erich gave, I don't know, what is it called? Is it, huh? That's how it was, right. <clears throat> oh my gosh, that's, that's a, I, we read it at breakfast and you can't read it enough, it's uh, so wonderful. Anyway, like you can hear his voice. Can't you? When you read those stories, you can just hear, hear his voice. Uh, so, uh, uh, in, the, in the book, you might remember that Erich is talking about, you know, people asking him all the time, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do in my life? And so Erich is, you know, giving various uh, reflections on that, you know, how you, how you should how that you decide what to do. And at some point he says, you know, we're just like you people. We're no different. Yeah, we're no different. We, 
yeah, we don't know, you have to, you know, I mean, he, he, and so he was trying to, to say, it's not like we have some great insight. Uh, yeah, you say we have direct orders from Baba, well, you know, that does, so that doesn't always mean that you know what to do. And he said, so let me give you an example. And so then he tells a story, which I'm sure you might probably remember, and where he is on duty outside Baba's, uh, at Mehrazad, he's outside the, uh, Baba, where Baba's staying. Baba's actually was staying in, in Pindu's room, which became Pindu's room, that, that little cabin. And Baba had Erich on duty outside. So Baba said to Erich, uh, don't disturb me under any circumstances. And don't come in here uh, unless I clap. And if I clap, you should, you're to come immediately. And he repeated it. Harry said, yeah, yeah, Baba, I, yeah. I, yeah, I know, I understand, Baba, yeah. Baba said, remember that. So, all right. So, <laughs> So uh, Eric is sitting there, you know, like he does, the watchman there, and Baba's doing his work. And at some point, uh, Eric feels something crawling over his feet. And he looks down, and it's a snake, a poisonous snake. And it crawls over his feet, and starts to go into Baba's room. Now Baba's feet are placed right where this snake is going in, you see. So uh, Erich saw this, he saw the snake beginning to go in under the door, and so what did he do? He, he ran over, he grabbed the snake by the tail. And, you know, when you do that, uh, what happens is the snake turns around. Right? So he turned around, got the snake out, and at that moment, Baba clapped. And so what to do? So uh, Erich didn't respond, and so he, he took the snake out, and he uh, uh, killed the snake. And meanwhile, Baba is clapping furiously. And yeah, and so Erich uh, goes in, into Baba's room, and, uh, and Baba says, so "Where were you? Why didn't you come? I clapped, and I heard some noise. Also, you're not supposed to move." Erich says, "Yeah." And so he explained to Baba what happened, and Baba said. No, Baba said, yeah, whatever it is, you should obey me. I said, did you not hear what I said? I said, don't disturb me, and if I clap, you're to come immediately. And what did you do? You didn't come. I don't care. What did you do? And he, he berated him. And I said, yeah. Baba, you're so right. Yeah, yeah. I should have. I should obey you, Baba, and all that. You know, he was contrite like that. <laughs> and then Erich said, in telling the story, Erich said, "But you know, here's the thing. If I had it to do again, I would do the same thing." I disobey Baba. Yeah, I did, but I had to protect his body. He said, I had to follow my conscience. He said, sometimes you just have to follow your conscience. And he said, that's how it is with him. That's how it is. I would do it again. That reminds me of two things. <clears throat> when you follow your conscience and then someone, and I don't know if this, how accurate this is, but it sounds pretty good. Um, they said to Baba about free will. 
Because if you're going to follow your conscience, right, then you're going to exercise your free will, right? And so, so they he asked Baba about free will, and Baba said, oh, raise your hand. So he did. And then Baba kept talking to everybody else. And the guy said, but Baba, what about free will? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, raise your other hand. So the guy raised both hands. And Baba kept talking, conversing with people, and the guy just standing there, two hands in the air. He goes, Baba, free will. He says, oh, raise your leg. <laughs> so the guy is literally like this, and Baba goes on and on and on. He's like, but Baba, please. I'm saying free will. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He goes, raise your other leg. <laughs> and so Baba said, free will is rooted in divine will. Right? So, so, say again? So he, Baba said, he said to raise your other leg. And the guy was like, but I can't. And that Baba said, well, free will is rooted in divine will. So, <clears throat> conscience, wanting to love Baba like Erich did, would say he would do it again. You had personal experience of Baba in the body. Nash, you as well, right? So you get the order, and then the rest of us, most of us, sorry if I leave anybody out, we never had Baba in the body, right? But yet we love him and we're serving him. And what blew my mind, first coming to India, right? Forget how I got to Baba, but getting there, that was a big thing for me. And he did two things with me, which I call sweet and sour Baba. Because, because it's uncanny how he can attend to every little thing, no matter how small or how great, simultaneously. So when I went there, I couldn't wait to get to Samadhi, right? Couldn't wait to get to RT. And I saw a lot of people buying garlands and, you know, putting them all down on Baba's tomb, right? So I was, of course, conscience, ego, don't know. Um, I would find, instead of paying for a flower, I would find one on the floor all the time. Because as you walked from the Pilgrim Center, right, you would go through, you'd see beautiful flowers, and they'd fall on the floor, and I'd take it, and I'd put it on his tomb, right? So I couldn't wait to do that, to please my beloved. Sorry for my back. Uh, so um, I come, and I usually go find the flower, and prayers are going on, and then, of course, uh, the RT would start. So I still had time, because I was in the queue. So I had plenty of time, right, find a flower. And, <laughs> and the prayers stop, and a fight breaks out. <laughs> Very uncharacteristic. Now, it was one of my third time or whatever there, but it was an American woman or from the, from the West and an Indian woman. And she wasn't having any of it. She wanted to either sing louder, uh, she was going to hop the line, whatever she needed her baba. And this, this Western woman wasn't having it, and this was getting out of hand. And I got transfixed. So Dolly had come over, right, and they kind of smoothed everything out. And the line is moving, right? And I'm getting up to the tomb, and I go, oh, Baba, I forgot your flower. <laughs> Halfway around the world, I come to see my Baba, and a little fight breaks out, and I don't give the flower. And now the line's moving, and I'm about ready to go in, and my hand's on the tomb, and I'm just like, I'm a loser. I'm just pathetic. At that moment, <laughs> there's an Indian man, his wife, and two children behind me. And I'm just dejected. And I go to go into the tomb, and I'm about to bow and step in. And the guy, I'd never met him before, taps me on my shoulder. I turn around, and he hands me a rose. It's like, one in the tomb, and I put the rose on the tomb, and I lost it. The love just... They carried me out. They left me on a bench somewhere. <laughs> um, so, this is the truth. This is why I'm saying conscience, but 
rooted in divine will because fast forward two years, I go back. Literally, an argument breaks out, right? And once again, <laughs> I did it again. After that amazing experience, I forget the flower. I'm like, you schmuck, right? And I'm like, well, that, now, now, now you're a schmuck. Like, there's just no, like, he did all this for you, and, you know, and, and I'm just, like, really just dejected. And, and this time, Hardeep broke up the fight. And now I got to go in, <laughs> right? Just can't make this up. An Indian man, his wife, two children in front of me walk in the tomb. I'm next up. The guy didn't go in for 10 seconds, stepped back out, looked at me, and handed me a rose. <laughs> Guinea from the Bronx, the littlest detail, his love is just unimaginable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm there. I'm going to get a flower off the floor. I'm going to give it to my baba. I'm me, 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 me. And he's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. But that's sweet baba. And then there was sour baba. Because I was out there again. And I met a woman from Christ Church. And her name was Wilma. And I don't know how we hit it off, but we did on Seclusion Hill, you name it, it's as if I knew this woman my whole life. And, and our worlds couldn't be more separate. And she said to me, because she was leaving, she was, Paul, let's run up to the hill. It's the middle of the day. It's really hot. We'll get some samadhi time. Nobody's up there. We're going to slide right in. Yeah. So we go up. And I'm ready to run into the samadhi. But she had met someone. And I said, I see you in there. And sure enough, I went in. But there were a lot of people there. There was one spot left. So I bowed, I kissed, and I slid into the spot. And then I started thinking, what about Wilma? And I said, oh, Baba, I mean, I'm, I'm still going to be here, you know, at least another week. But not Wilma. I'll tell you, Baba, I'll come back. <laughs> I'll give my spot up for Wilma. Okay? So I'm... I'm sitting there, I'm like on my knees, and Wilma comes in, and she looks, and all the six spots are pretty much taken, right? So she goes, and she kisses the tomb, and she goes to leave, and I go to get up, and I can't move. And she's looking at me, and I'm trying to pull myself. My legs are locked. And I'm trying to drag myself on the floor. Nothing. And she's staring at me like, what's wrong? Is, is he having a fit? Like, what, what's wrong with this guy, right? And I'm like, what? So she goes to walk out of the tomb, and as soon as she goes to walk out of the tomb, a guy gets up and walks out, and she slides right into his spot, and my legs let go. And I was like, and the voice in my head said, Paul, you do nothing. I do everything. And I just bowed. So this sweet and sour bow. You know, but everything out of love, out of consciousness, you want to give it to someone. Now, this is personal. What you and him had is personal. What you and him have is personal, right? So I, I just wanted to share that with you because I hear conscience and you got to see him live and we get these interpersonal connections with Baba. Jay Mirabha. Jay Baba. Oh, thank you for sharing, Paul. That's a beautiful story. Beautiful <gasps> story. Um, let me say a word about conscience just because you brought it up. Because, uh, and I didn't say what I th think it means. Uh, what I gather is, and Baba doesn't use the word very often, but he uses inner voice, he uses intuition, you know, and that's the same thing. It is, conscience is, by definition, the capacity of the human to discern what is really true and right. And 
if you believe the, the, what Baba is saying and what the spiritual traditions say, every human being has a conscience. I don't know if you've had this experience of wanting to do something, right? And your conscience says, no, don't do that. Has that ever happened to you? It happens to me about every day, at least once a day, right? So conscience is, is that capacity we have to kind of intuitively know. No, this is not what we should do. It's not right. Wouldn't please Bob and so forth and so on. Now, having said that, conscience is not just something that we have as a capacity with no content. All of us have a conscience shaped by our lives, by our influences, by the, in my case, you know, Elizabeth or Kitty or the Mondeley and all that. You know, they, Baba's words, all of that, shapes the conscience. It doesn't answer the questions. It just shapes so that that capacity I have is able to speak or express in a moment when I need it. And Baba says, you see, if you, if you, if you listen, then, you know, my, you will hear my voice, and that's the voice of conscience. And that's why in Erich's story, it's very important and revealing, because what Erich is saying, in essence, is Baba's voice within you is finally what you must follow, whether he's in the body or not, whether you, he is given this order or that order. And Baba says in this quote, same thing. Follow your conscience. Now, is it un unerring? No. Erich himself said in the same story, he said, yeah, we make mistakes. Yeah, we do. We make mistakes. But he said, but that doesn't matter. If you do your best and you follow what you feel Baba wants, that's all he's asking. Yeah, you can say, yeah, we, oh, I shouldn't have done that. No, but you did it. It's his will. And you call it a mistake. But with Baba, really, there are no mistakes. So anyway, that's conscience. And uh, I don't feel we use the word enough uh, because it does not mean, obviously, that we have some will that expresses itself within us. There's no such thing because there's only one will. Erich, uh, Erich uh, underscored this with me 100,000 times. Yeah, no, there's just his will, that's all there is. You mean I can't do any? No, you can do nothing. <laughs> but, you know, what if I want to do, you know, uh, you know do, I mean, I, can't I even make an effort? No. I said, then why do I do anything? Why do I do anything? Why should I try? Why should I get up in the morning? And, and well, I'll just do nothing. Eric says, no, you won't do that. <laughs> You won't do that. You will, you will do it. You will do it. Why? You have to do it. You know, you don't, it's not up to you. It's written already. You do it. You play that part. Or, yeah, okay. So, it, it's all his will. But in the living out of the dream, if you will, or living in this dream, or living, uh, the, the, the performing in the play, however, whatever metaphor you like, uh, uh, the way to know what to do as best we can before we know the will. I don't know the will tomorrow, so I gotta decide today. You know, do I do this, do I do that? I don't worry about it, but I, you know, I, you make decisions, right? And you do the best, but you don't. Look into your conscience, listen to Baba, he says, and Erich says, and do that. That's all. I mean, it's not right or wrong. Somebody may feel differently. Somebody else's conscience may say something really different. Doesn't matter. You follow that. But what it says in the discourse is, no, it doesn't matter what it says there. What is it here? All right, all right. So he finally hammered that into me, and, I, and I've tried to live that. <clears throat> so conscience, or that inner voice, is Meher Baba's speaking 
Our true self has a vehicle to communicate with us, in other words. He is not the discourses. He is not the Mandali. He is not the center. He is not India, the Samadhi. Baba is not any of that. Baba is my real self. And Baba didn't come for us to awaken to enjoy the samadhi or awaken to read the books or awaken to follow you know, what he said on page 215. Baba came to awaken us to our true self. And he says, whatever it is, follow your conscience. Oh, Baba, but that's anarchy. Yes, it is anarchy. That's exactly right. Every person for himself or herself. <laughs> no, it is. It is exactly that. And who are we to say if the other person's right in their conscience or wrong? We can say it. We can, we can certainly share that if we feel, you know, differently. But we don't judge it. Because it's Baba. And maybe Baba wants to prompt something within us that... Uh, 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 you know, will lead to something terrible and disastrous. Well, then that's God's will. So, anyway, and then the other thing I'll say, and then I'm going to open it back up, because I love the fact that, that, that Paul has started the sharing part, and I don't want to not do that. Um, but the other thing I wanted to share with you about this is how I came across this, <clears throat> because this is typical of Baba. It's like Paul says, it's the details. Baba's in the details. Um, and the timing. Baba's all about timing. So what happened was, and I'm not going to please, I'm not going to revisit all that happened in 1994, 95, oh my God. Um, I would, but I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't think about it anymore. So, but it's a part of my life that defined my life. <clears throat> so it defined everything in my life. And it turned out to be a great blessing, let's just say. And it turned out to be a great gift from Bob. So when that all blew up and Christopher and I were attacked and my mother was attacked, and we were told we were betraying Baba, even by some close to Baba, we were told that. When we were told we were destroying the center, when we were told that we were that voting for me on the board would be like voting, uh, Baba says, this person said, lust is Satan, so voting for Charles would be like voting for Satan. And I'm not voting for Satan. That was a good board meeting. <laughs> that was one of the better board meetings. No, I'm just saying. So I'm only giving you that flavor, not to go backwards. I never think about it anymore. Honestly, I don't. But it was a time when I didn't know what to do. Now, I had been with Chris for five years. We considered ourselves married. We, we had this committed relationship, and we never thought that anybody would say, well, no, you are living in sin, you're breaking South Carolina law, you are betraying Meher Baba, who is against this, you are hurting the center. We never, I, in my, I mean, call me naive, I didn't see it coming. So, what to do? Especially when Mani and Eric, of course, were fully supportive. Not that they accepted homosexuality and stuff. They had a lot of work to do on that, believe me. They moved on that, but they had, it wasn't about, for them, homosexuality. It was about me. It was about Jane. And they were not going to let this happen to us if they could help it. And so they stood up. And I'll never forget how grateful I was. Because to me, they're the two, of the, they're the two greatest, except for Mara, of his disciples. <clears throat> and so, anyway, that was wonderful. But there were some others close to Baba who took the complete opposite view, and Monty was very upset about it. You know, wrote a letter even to the board, and then it got circulated around the world to Baba's groups and so forth. And all of that left me wondering if this person so close to Baba and this other person in the United States who everybody reveres and 
is one of Baba's close ones in the, in the West. If he thinks that I am Satan, then what do I do? Is my whole life, what do I do? I don't, I, I, didn't, under, I didn't think that it would be possible to give up my relationship or to say I'm not going to live in my home, which Baba put me on the deed after all. Yeah, Baba, of all the children, he asked that my name go on there with my mother. So, you know, that was Baba. I, it was his order. It wasn't my idea. I didn't say I want to be on the deed. So it was my home, legally. It is today my home. My name is the only one on that deed. Wendy and Buzz live there, but it's mine. By Baba's order. I mean, they can have it, but you know what I'm saying. So I didn't know what to do. If that's true, that I love my husband, I don't feel we are doing anything wrong. And on the, on the contrary, I thought we were, we were living a life to please Baba and that he would be happy. If, if we would help at the center, he would be happy and all that. My mother was desperate for help. She was f really falling apart. I just felt this is what he wants. But these people very close to Baba were saying something quite different. <clears throat> so what to do? And this is the part that is, like parts of your story, not believable. <laughs> I believe you. But these things that we think of, uh, coincidences, no. They are not, but you know, they are so strangely unbelievable. So I, when this was at its height, I'm in my room at Mayor House, uh, and I'm looking on the shelf of stuff I haven't looked at in a long time, because we didn't live there yet, uh, mother stuff, and well, stuff I left there also. And I had all these pamphlets there from the old days, you know, like Elizabeth's stuff, and just old, old, little pamphlets, booklets, <clears throat> and just, you know, because I didn't know what else. I was just sort of in a daze, and so I just pulled one out that I hadn't looked at in, I don't know, when, maybe ever. Blue cover, sayings of Mayor Baba, never been reprinted. You don't see it anywhere because there are no copies. <clears throat> yeah, I have a few copies, but that's it. Some of the sayings were printed elsewhere. <clears throat> <clears throat> in the journals and stuff. but So I pulled that off the shelf at my most desperate moment. I just opened it up. Sort of like they do in India, you know, they op or in, in, in Iran, really. They open up Hafez, you know. So I just opened it up, <clears throat> and I saw this, which I'd never seen before, and it seemed so unlike anything I'd ever read before. Do nothing even to please me or the world against the dictates of your own conscience. Unhesitatingly, do what you think to be right and proper, despite the opposition of the world. Let your mind be firm as a rock that resists strong blasts of wind from all sides. <clears throat> I saw that. And it changed everything. I knew that my conscience was what I should follow. I'm not saying that the, the people who opposed us were not following theirs. They were, I'm sure. I'm not questioning their sincerity. And they should. They have their part to play. Who am I to say? I'm just saying that it's not a matter of who's right and wrong. It's a matter of follow your conscience. Follow your conscience, because that's following Baba. Wait a minute, didn't Baba say this and this about sex, or, you know, can two men be really married? That doesn't say that in the disc, you know, okay, you can say all those things, doesn't matter. If my conscience says something else, then that's what I'm gonna follow. And you say, oh, well, now, then you might do this, or you might do that. Yeah, sure, I might. Some of these kids at the youth office are gonna do all sorts of things that you know, people will say, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. Baba wouldn't like. Well, 
well, who they, how do they know what Baba would like or not like? They are Baba. They're not any more or less Baba than me. And let me tell you, if you follow your conscience and it, and it just, you know, looks like to everybody else that you're just, you know, disobeying or you're a terrible human being, so what? If you follow your conscience or you follow Baba's inner voice, let's put it that way, you're free to be whatever Baba wants you to be. And nobody else may like it. So that's what we did. And, um, and that's when I, my life changed. Uh, all that I thought I knew about Mayor Baba uh, was shattered. All that I depended on, or was attached to, was broken, including my lifelong uh, vision that I would be at the center for the rest of my life when, when the time came. I didn't ask for it. I didn't necessarily want or not want. It's just that's what I thought Baba gave me, and that's what Elizabeth was she was determined that that would be the case. She prepared me for that, and that's what she wanted. So I said, fine. At the right time, that's what I'll do. And I thought that was the right time, 1994. So all I'm saying is that all of that blew up. Blew up. And you know what? That's his job. You sign up with Baba, that's what he's going to do. He says, I am the great taker, not the giver. I'm the taker. I take it all. But I give you the real thing. I take everything else. And after that happened to me, and after for a number of years I had to process it, for a few years after that I couldn't think of Baba much, I couldn't talk about Baba much, you know, I went into a state of shock. But after we got through all that, I realized Baba has given me a new life with him, free to be with him and my husband. So that's why this is so important to me, this quote. Yeah. Beautiful. So let me uh, open up this conversation a little bit as Paul has already done and and just you know any thoughts you have about following conscience or experiences or you know if you have a question about it or you think something I've said is off the wall just <laughs> just one thing that I wanted to share 1994 was also a very intense year for me and as I was going through it, I was aware, I certainly was aware of what you were going through, but I was aware of many Baba lovers seemed to be going through a lot, and even friends who were spiritually alive, but not Baba lovers, seemed to be going through that sort of intense thing. <clears throat> yeah. And it occurred to me at the time that for Baba's 100th birthday, he was giving out all these presents, these really valuable presents, which didn't feel so nice at the time, but, more long-lasting in their in their transformation. Yeah, yes. That's a beautiful way to put it, Tony. Yeah, yeah. it's a gift. Yeah. I think what happened in 1994 for me was a gift. Yeah. One of his great gifts. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not covering over the pain, and I'm not saying that people did the right thing or the wrong mm -hmm. thing. You know, if people hurt other people, then okay, I'm not going to say that's wonderful, but the whole thing was a gift. That's what I think you're right. And the other thing that comes to mind on the general subject, which I often remember, was this fellow who, um, Baba lover, who was sending letter after letter to Baba, bewailing how he was constantly falling in his spiritual quest, and he was, he was failing and falling, and he was calling. And, and they came in, these one after another, and here was another letter coming in, and Baba asked, who is it? And he told him, he said, tell that fool it is my will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. I love that. I, I just would like to know the follow up of when everything came when everything came crashing down. The, the that almost like vacuum after that. Like, what do I do? I'd like to hear you talk about that time a little more. If you, if there's anything you can say about that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that question, Ed, uh, Edward. It's, um, well, Christopher and I uh, sort of retreated um, from everything into our, into our lives, our own lives, our dogs and, you know, Bird, you know, we just retreated into that, and uh, and we had Jane still, you know, for a few more years, and we needed to be present for her, so we did concentrate on that. The sweetened thing is that Christopher was able, and he was very very close to Jane. And he was able to go and help her and take care of her when she got ill. And so though we didn't live there, we were able to go back and give her support. He cared for her when she was dying, and uh, that was a real blessing. I think that this whole trauma that happened, which really a lot of it was aimed at her, honestly, um, I think it triggered the disease, the pancreatic cancer. I think she might have gotten it anyway, but I, I think it contributed. And anyway, she, uh, and she, you know, it, uh, she was just, uh, but she came to be free, free in the end. She, she was transformed by all that happened, including her suffering. And she welcomed going to Baba. She said, I don't mind dying. I welcome it. I just don't want the pain. <laughs> so we gave her all this stuff, you know, the, the patch and, the, you know, things to, to make, because that's all she asked, because I, I just don't like the pain. I said, well, that's, that's fine. You don't have to have the pain. And, you know, so that was one deeply important part of, of that time. The other part was I just was not, I just couldn't relate to Baba at all in the way I used to. I just, it was, even thinking about it, just, you know, just was, uh, it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't give talks. Uh, and when I did start to give a talk again, I could tell that I just was kind of holding on to stuff. And, you know, it wasn't, it didn't feel right. It wasn't <laughs> truly loving. And uh, so, you know, it was a struggle to, to a real struggle to forgive. But Baba says, it's not just forgiveness. He said, Baba says, that's the easy part. It's forget. It's one thing to forgive, it's another to forget. And I could forgive, and I forgave every day, because you have to do it over and over again because next day you feel differently again. Uh, so yeah, I, I know literally it was my constant prayer, forgiveness. Uh, you know, not, that sounds condescending to people, but you know what? I hope that they forgave me, you know? I mean, whatever they felt I was doing. So I, I think it's good for people to forgive. Not good, it's essential. Uh, but forgetting, no, I couldn't forget. And uh, for a while until the shattering freed me to experience him anew. And it liberated me. Because then I realized, you know, I don't know anything about Baba. All I know is that he loves me and He's who, he's who I really am, right? 
it came down to the barest of bones and, uh, and rebuilt from there. I'm so happy because ever since then, I, I don't have anything to say about him. So you say, well, why are you talking if you don't have anything to say? Because, because I don't, I don't have to think of what, I mean, I do, I prepare very hard for anything I say, because I, that's what you, one does for Bala, but then I don't, I don't think about it. It's up to him then. And that was different for me, like rather than saying, well, you know, do I say this, do I say that? No, it's gone. Why? Because I don't know anything, so let him do it. If he's going to do it, he's going to do it. If he's not going to do it, he's not going to do it. But so the freedom was that gift in the, the, that, those years following what happened. The, the freedom to be myself, to be who I really am more authentically. I mean, I'm not fully who I am, but I mean, I'm closer to who I am. Yeah, freedom. You know, it's so amazing to be free, and all my life I had been bound, living a double life, hiding that I was gay for most of my life, uh, afraid that people wouldn't love me if they knew who I really was, uh, including Mondly people. Uh, living a double life was hell. Growing up with Baba was a blessing, but it was also living in hell. It was hell. And I just asked Baba over and over again, you know, give me someone in my life who can, who can help me be my companion and help me through all this. Hell, make me live authentically. And so Baba gave me Christopher. And what happened in 94 liberated us to have a true marriage in him. And whether Baba was working on the whole LGBT community through that, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, right? Because that's how he does things. But I'm just saying, Christopher volunteering at the center, and the reason he was there it was because he heard about Baba through a teacher and he came down to the center because, but also mo he was interested in Baba, but he was motivated by the fact that this teacher told him, there's a woman there who knows everything about St. Teresa of Avila, so you would want to meet her. And, and, and Christopher loved St. Teresa of Avila. So that was a, another draw. He went, the first day he went, this is 1988, and met my mother. And he fell in love, you know, with her, and she with him. I mean, they, they just connected so deeply and um, uh, talked about Teresa and everything. You know, it's just, and then he went into the barn. He said, he told my mother that he wanted to go into the barn. So he went into the barn and, um, he looked up at Baba's picture in the barn. And he said, that, that's the one who's been with me all my life. That's him. You know? He's always felt there was someone with him. And then he saw the picture, he said, but, but that, and he knew, right? In the barn, he knew. And a year later, I come down to visit and I'm volunteering by taking people around on a tour. Christopher is in the barn volunteering and cleaning the furniture. And he sees me come in and I see him and we know. We know. You know, Baba gave me that and uh, And here's a, a funny footnote in for one of our earliest conversations about we knew, and so now we were just filling in information. You know, who are you? 
where are you from? Of course, he was a lot younger, and my mother was scandalized by that. <laughs> I said, well, you know, uh, I got this long end of that stick, you know. <laughs> uh, but no, he, he, he in our first, when our first conversation, we talk, we're filling in, and I said, you know, uh, I went to Emory University, and he said, oh, you know, I went to Emory University. Uh, of course, 17 years later. Uh, for his freshman year. He just went for one year because he transferred because he was in love with somebody, you know. And so he left, but he was there one year. And I said, oh, you were there? Yeah, he said, I said, you know, I, when my freshman year I was there, I lived in Longstreet. He said, oh, so did I. I said, you lived in Longstreet too? Yeah, yeah, you lived in Longstreet. I said, oh, yeah, I lived on the second. He said, yeah, so did I. I said, my room was, uh, you know, 222. It was the last on the, he said, that was my room. I said, now wait a minute, there are two beds. Mine was on the, the hall side. And he said, that was my bed. Get away. 17 years apart. So it's like Baba saying, you think I don't know these things? <laughs> you think I haven't planned this? You think I'm making this up as I go along? You know, what do you think? Or is it the script written? So I just, it's, too long an answer to your beautiful question, but I just, and I don't even know if I've captured it, but I just feel, I felt differently about Mondley people, about everything, and I love them all, you know, but they're not Baba. And we went to 93 to India, and it was a beautiful visit. Mondley were very sweet to us, very loving, supportive. Mani was particularly loving. She wanted Jane to know that, eventually, she wanted Jane to know that she accepted Christopher as part of our family. And she wrote that. And she did everything to make us feel comfortable and happy. Whether she thought homosexuality was this or that, it didn't matter to her. What mattered to her was my connection to Baba, Christopher's connection to Baba, Elizabeth, and Jane. Jane and Monty were sisters, and very, very, very close. So what, that was Monty's response. And Erich was very sweet and gracious to us. We got to go on walks together with Erich in the mornings. Can you imagine? Uh, it was really beautiful. And that was my last time. I never went back. I haven't been back since. Yeah, I don't feel the need. But I mean, I may someday. I'm not saying I don't want to go back. It's just, that was it. And I felt, because my life now with Baba is, I don't, I don't need to go to the center or to India. Or, you know, I, it's, it's, it's still wonderful. I'm going to go to the center soon, and it's fine. I'm I, looking forward. But, you know, so that's how I changed. Completely different life. It's so much better. <laughs> so much better. Jay <laughs> uh, Baba. Jay Baba. Baba. One little personal thing. Sure. Yeah. It's kind of not on the subject per se, but all these mentions of, of St. Teresa. Um, in the mid-70s, maybe in mid, a little bit past mid, um, I, I, I bought the autobiography, The Way of Perfection and Interior Castle, oh, the yeah. E. Allison Pierce translation. Oh, yeah. and. And I would just spend every night with St. Teresa. And, and then I'd do my Baba like quiet time, internal time, and Baba would awaken wonderful scenes with him. But when I was reading St. Teresa, she was there. It was as if she was speaking to me yeah. in that. So when you mentioned Christopher yeah. and your mother having oh, that, yeah. well, I have that connection too. Oh. And this is just totally nothing to do with anything. It's a lot to do with no, everything. The, the oh. next thing, though, oh, the next is thing. Okay. nothing to do with anything. But my wife and I were married on 222. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Anyway. Well, other, other uh, people want to say something or ask something or add something, you're perfectly welcome to, yes, Greg. <laughs> you shared so much about Erich, and um, it was around that time I had a Baba dream. Yeah. And um, 
in the dream, Bob was telling me, you know, to remember him more and more. And I said, okay. He said, like Arich, he said. He said, look at Arich. <laughs> Arich, he said in this dream, he said, Arich is the greatest disciple I have ever had in any advent. <laughs> you know? I said, wow. So, my next trip to India, I guess it was 1995, um, I told Arich this. And he said, any advent? <laughs> <laughs> Just showing his personal side on it. So, anyway, I just thought yeah, that is, that's wonderful. Uh, I love that. Yeah. 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 Charles? Yes. Um, we're getting close to the music session. Okay, good. So, would you like to close with anything? Oh, okay. All right. No, or sing. No, I'll leave that. I'll leave that to people who can actually sing. Um, I only sing to Baba uh, and Christopher. I do sing to Christopher, who who appreciates it. I write him bad poetry also. Well, I call it bad poetry. I don't know what it is, but it's sometimes one can't say anything unless it's in a poem. I don't know if you had that experience. Sometimes I just have to write it as a poem. And I don't I know how to write poetry exactly, but so every you know anniversary or birthday or whatever, we have two anniversaries because we got married in December 6th, Elizabeth, day Elizabeth went to Baba. And we got first time married in the sense of getting together on, on April 21st, 30, 34, more than 34 years ago now. Um, so every anniversary, you know, I try to write him a poem. Um, and uh, some things you just can't say unless you, you put it in a poem. So I can't sing, but I can, I can, I can write poetry. For one, I have an audience of one. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, you know, I, um, You know, I feel uh, being here, which is you know, the first time in so long I've actually been with other people in person, <laughs> Baba people. But I just have felt so privileged. I mean, you all have given your lives to him. And I don't know, I just... That is such an extraordinary thing. It's his grace. But that Baba would do that, and you all have in your different ways, like we all do with Baba, your challenges, whether it's health, whether it's this or that, family, we all have these challenges in our lives that, you know, and yet, you see his hand in everything. And you feel the gift of his love, whether it's sweet or sour, right? You see that he's, he's at work. And that's so inspiring to me. I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful to be here with you all. Jay Baba. I think I speak for all of us how we love you. <laughs> so, Phil, if you'll help us set up for another round of.